It is the most advanced and most expensive aircraft in world history. It became a legend before it even rolled off the production line. With its state-of-the-art technology and shrouded by a mantle of stealth, it can go into harm's way, deliver 40,000 pounds of conventional or nuclear bombs and is almost undetectable by any radar. For years, this awesome deliverer of death has been shrouded under a cloak of secrecy. It is the B-2 Stealth Bomber. In the final year of the 20th century, the flying wing had come of age and gone into battle. But nearly 100 years earlier, men had dreamed that the flying wing was the future of flight and the future of war. But it wasn't until the early 1930s that the dream became a reality when two young brothers, Reimer and Walter Horton, first began to design wings for the new Nazi regime in Germany. The Horton brothers were very interested in highly efficient gliders. And it's, it's not such a great leap of imagination to, to realize that the most efficient form for any flying machine is just a pure wing. With the outbreak of World War II in 1939, the Horton brothers continued their groundbreaking work under a shroud of secrecy. By 1941, they were exploring the use of a transport wing to help in the planned invasion of Britain. At the same time, another German, Alexander Lippitsch, was working on his own wing design, when in late 1941, his ME-163 Comet crossed the 600 mile per hour barrier for the first time. The potential of rocket power, combined with a flying wing design, would change aviation history. Meanwhile, the Horton brothers had gone down another path. By 1942, they were working on a 61 feet wingspan aircraft called the H-09. It would be powered by the Junkers turbojet engine that would be fitted to the ME-262. The Horton number nine was the pinnacle of the brothers' development of the flying wing. And the prototype uh, achieved a speed of something like 500 miles an hour. They had clearly demonstrated that you could build a vehicle with jet engines, that you could fly it, that it had very high speed potential, and so they had really uh, validated the concept. Another of Reimar Horton's designs was the H0229, built of wood and with its engines housed in the wings with their exhausts vented on the top of the wing, this aircraft would have been extremely difficult to detect. Also, if it could have flown, it would have had a top speed of 620 miles per hour, the fastest aircraft in World War II. But while the Germans were developing their wings, a 40-year-old American aircraft designer called Jack Northrop was quietly working on a flying wing design of his own. Jack had been dreaming about flying wings since the 1920s and had long held the belief that the way to success in wing design was by reducing the drag created by a tail and fuselage. Northrop's idea was, first of all, to minimize the tail and the fuselage and then, as a last step, to get rid of the tail altogether. So, so he went through a whole series of, of uh, smaller steps in order to achieve the all-wing configuration. In December 1942, his N1M flying wing took to the air, and over the next few years, more and more of his designs were being refined and tested. But by May 1945, the long and bitter struggle to defeat Nazi Germany was over. Its industrial and technological centers lay in ruins, along with its dreams of a flying wing aircraft. But Jack Northrop was convinced that where the Germans had failed, his wing would become the greatest aircraft in the world. All he would need was the raw power to do it. May 1945. Nazi Germany was smashed into submission, and with it went its hopes and dreams of building a flying wing aircraft. But while post-war America continued to build conventional aircraft such as the B-29, 
one man pursued his vision. In 1946, Jack Northrop tested his massive 400 mile per hour XB-35 flying wing. Powered by four turboprop engines, this aircraft was seen by some as the bomber of the future. This was where Northrop's vision really started to take shape because the XB-35 uh, had a wingspan of about 60 meters. This is a big airplane, even by today's standards. Its problem was that whilst its top speed was about 400 miles an hour, its speed in long-range crews was only 185 miles an hour. Northrop met this challenge when, in 1947, he introduced his new YB-49. Powered by eight Allison jet engines, this 172-feet wingspan Goliath was capable of flying at over 500 miles per hour at a ceiling of 40,000 feet. Jack Northrop had taken the American flying wing off the design boards and into the air. Now a preview of the flying wing transport of tomorrow. Jack Northrop's vision for his flying wing was not just as a bomber. He also saw it as a passenger aircraft. Because the wing could carry far greater loads than conventional aircraft, his airliner would be capable of carrying 80 passengers with an observation lounge and an ability to fly across America in four hours. But the YB-49's days were numbered. Although years ahead of its time, it was incredibly difficult to fly. And without computers to help control it, the US Air Force felt that as a bomber, it was too unstable and dangerous. In late 1949, and in an unprecedented decision, the US government ordered that all Northrop's YB-49s were to be destroyed. The flying wing looked destined to be confined to just a footnote in history. From the Air Force's point of view, uh, I don't think you could quibble with the decision they made on the day, given the, the uh, vehicles that were on the table in front of them. But the destruction of the first flying wing came at a perilous time in history. Relationships between East and West were rapidly deteriorating, and the Cold War was heating up. The world was entering a new era of nuclear power and nuclear testing. The Soviet Union had built up a huge arsenal of weapons, and the West responded. In a policy that was known as MAD, mutually assured destruction, the heavy bomber was seen as the first line of attack. SAC, Strategic Air Command, put into place a global system called Operation Chrome Dome, in which massive B-52s would constantly patrol the Earth, ready at a moment's notice to fly to any target deep within the Soviet Union and attack. But SAC was also alarmed at the Soviet Union's new improved radar and SAMs, surface-to-air missiles. SAC was determined not to let its giant B-52 bomber fleet become sitting targets for the Soviet Union. It became apparent that any bomber aircraft that had to penetrate Soviet airspace was going to have to run a layered gauntlet of air defense missiles that could shoot down aircraft no matter how high or how low they were flying. The only way to evade Soviet air defense missiles was to fly so high that you're never going to hit a target with your bomb. What the U.S. needed was an aircraft that could evade the Soviet defense system, fly to its target, deliver its weapons, and bring its crew safely home, all under the cloak of invisibility. But to do this meant a complete rethink on designing and constructing aircraft. Every aircraft has what is called its radar cross-section. When an electromagnetic radar beam hits an aircraft, it bounces off anything that is large or pronounced, such as engines, straight wings or cockpits. The radar operator sees all this information coming back and can determine the size, height and direction of an aircraft. This is known as the aircraft's radar signature. But if you can deny this information to the enemy's radar, then the plane will become almost invisible. 
The mantle that will shroud the aircraft from its pursuers has a new name, stealth. During the mid-1970s, the US government put out a top-secret tender to selected aircraft manufacturers. Their objective was to come up with a feasible design for an advanced technology bomber, capable of long-range, high payload, and low observability. By some strange irony, the winner was Northrop's. Thirty years after seeing the destruction of their fleet of YB-49s, Northrop's were back in the flying wing business. During the early 1980s, Northrop worked on designs for their stealthy bomber. The entire project was buried deep within the highly classified and ultra-secret Black Program. At the time, the US Black Program was so secret that even those who knew about it were forbidden from ever acknowledging its existence. Even Congress was denied the knowledge of what or where money was being spent. The Soviet Union was carefully examining things like American technical journals and the American defense budget so that they would know what threats they'd have to deal with in the upcoming years. And in order not to have this very nifty new bit of stealth technology apparent to the Soviets just by picking up the annual published defense budget, they had to make it what's called a black program. With costs rising higher and higher, Northrop and its partners worked against the clock. Originally, the contract had been clear in its requirement. Build a heavy bomber that could never be seen by enemy radar. The solution, like the aircraft they were developing, seemed impossible. What Northrop had to do was develop a computer system that would enable the B-2, as it came to be called, to stabilize itself using feedback and the fastest computers they could get. So the stabilization of a B-2 flying wing configuration becomes a software and computer hardware problem. It becomes a cybernetic problem. By the mid-80s, and despite some of the most stringent checks, rumors began to circulate about what might be going on behind Jack Northrop's door. Press reports, artists' impressions, magazine articles began guessing as to what was happening in Palmdale, California. On November the 22nd, 1988, the Northrop Corporation staggered the world when it unveiled its B-2 stealth bomber. After years of working behind a complete screen of secrecy, the team of visionaries at Northrop had rewritten the rules of aircraft design. The technological array was awesome, with over 130 onboard computers controlling every element of the aircraft, the B-2 was light years ahead of anything yet built. A variety of techniques were combined to make this aircraft almost invisible to radar. Its smooth surface and shape consists of curves, yet they are not consistently identical. The aircraft appears to continually change shape from whatever angle it is viewed, thereby confusing the radar. And whatever beams lock onto it are either reflected into outer space or are reduced and dissipated. Coated with RAM, radar absorbent materials such as carbon fiber composites and top secret reflective paint further reduces its detection from the enemy. Finally, its electronic countermeasures such as jamming an enemy's radar makes this aircraft almost undetectable. In fact, the B-2's radar cross-section is 1,000 times less than that of the B-52. If you take a really big aircraft, but make it essentially really flat, then when radar looks at it, instead of seeing a big round thing flying towards them, it'll, it'll just have a sort of pancake. It's like seeing the, the edge of a knife. When the B-2 made its maiden flight on July the 17th, 1989, it flew every bit as good as it looked. The B-2 has a 172-foot wingspan, is 69 feet long and 17 feet high. 